With that, I want to introduce our first speaker, Charles Newman, uh, has been uh, a stalwart guy with the community. He belongs to Social Venture Partners, which automatically, automatically says he cares. In fact, that's where we first met, I believe, was SVP. And um, he's, um, it, I, we, we handed out these bios for you, so I don't have to read all this stuff. What, what's important is Charles is trying to do what I'm asking everybody in the room to do and to tell your friends to do. Get involved. Become a citizen advocate. Be willing to put the time in to help, as Charles has, as a resident on the Montecito Finance, Water and Supply, the legal committees, he's, the, the CEC that he's involved in. I see John Steed back there from the CEC. Let's get involved and let's listen to what Charles thinks we can do potentially to turn this lem busy lemons into lemonade. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for having this program and even more so for inviting me to participate. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm gonna literally try to bring the message home. And by that I mean, what can homeowners do individually with respect to their personal properties, their homes, uh, to address the issue, which is certainly before us, of resilience. And the subtext of that is, um, not just residential resilience, but going beyond like for like. And I'm going to explain what, what that phrase means in just a moment. This is what I think is a wonderful, wonderful quote that's really grabbed me, which is, you never let a serious crisis, you never let a serious crisis go to waste. And what I mean by that, it's an opportunity to do things you think you could not do before. And that's from Rahm Emanuel. Great quote, I think something for us to keep in mind. Um, now, I'm going to speak tonight from the perspective of a planner, and I must say at the beginning, while I serve on the Montecito Planning Commission at DASA's pleasure, I'm speaking tonight individually, just with my own thoughts, my own ideas. I'm, I'm just one of five on that, that commission. So let's start with planning and development and as it's probably known by many of you, everybody has the right, generally speaking, to replace a seriously damaged or destroyed structure with a like structure that's provided for in our code. And it's made simple. A planning permit isn't required if the footprint, the size, the location, and so on are the same as a prior structure. And there's a 10% rule that's added to that. You can have 10% more or less footage, uh, gross area, and so on. A zoning permit is not required, and there's very limited design review. And I'm told, uh, as was the case during the T fire, that it's going to be an expedited process for permits in review. Now, there are a couple of exceptions, which is if you're in the coastal zone, if you have uh, a proposal to build something dissimilar to what you did, or you have an accessory building of any kind on your property that you're going to rebuild and so on, then more review is required. Uh, and for any um, property that is going to be rebuilt, you're going to need to get a building permit and compliance is going to be required with the 2016 building code. So those are the general requirements. Now, let's talk about the property is impacted. This is as of a week ago, the last tally we had from the County Planning and Development Commission indicated the following. There were 590 properties that were impacted. 240 of those were red tagged. Um, I happen to have two of those properties on my building. Fortunately, they're ancillary buildings. But 241 are red tagged, which means that they are not habitable properties. They're unsafe for occupancy or use. 151 were yellow tagged, meaning that there can be only limited access and use until the damage is remediated. And 198 of the properties were green tagged, which meant that there was not serious structural or other damage. So let's talk a little bit about resiliency and design. Um, there are obvious and important aspects to resiliency in designing residential properties. And of course, those two of those elements include fire and earthquake or seismic. Those are really 
presently well addressed in the current code. But I must say that resilience with respect to other climate change perils is not as comprehensively addressed or known and could well be inadequate. So let's talk about some of the things that we need to address in that context. Passive features in design, uh, be it, for instance, double glazed windows or the like, and resiliency that we're going to talk more about has a wonderful collateral benefit, which is greater sustainability. It means a greener home. It means less energy is used. It means a more viable property. But there's something new here. The equation in the calculus has changed because what happened here is really very different from anything that's happened before in our community. And there are very material differences between mud and debris flow from other climate perils we've experienced, notably fire. So as an example, there's greater impact on infrastructure. As Doss and everybody's alluded, we know what happened with respect to power, with respect to water, gas and the like. There have been, very dramatically, radical changes in topography and landscape. I toured some properties uh, where the, for instance, creek bed that was 80 yards was now 200 yards wide, where the property adjacent to it wasn't only part of the creek bed now, but the creek bed was 30 or 40 feet lower than it had been. There are, of course, lasting changes to the direction and to the expanse of water courses. And additionally, there are properties that have been partially or wholly just unbuildable, no question about it. There's greater difficulty uh, in a longer time incurred to remodel, to rebuild, uh, whether it's like for like or otherwise. And there's challenging policy and legal issues. As an example, what's the impact of having a property, as, as I do and maybe some of you do as well, that is now designated to be in the extreme hazard debris flow zone? Lucky me. What is that going to mean? It's going to have an impact, of course, as this incident did on real estate values, on real estate taxes and revenues to our county, and perhaps to the insurability of the property as well. Serious, lasting, ramifications. And very interestingly, there are complex and vexing intergovernmental relations here. As an example, FEMA is the basic authority with respect to flood control. And it is going to remap our area and designate new and different flood zones. FEMA is one authority. Of course, our county, Montecito being an unincorporated a non-governed entity other than by the county is going to play a key role in what happens in Montecito. And then, of course, we also have the state and the feds. So I just want to pose to you some kind of what-ifs. I want us to imagine what's possible, what might happen, and throw out some provocative ideas that may not fly, but they're worthy of consideration, I think. So first, of course, we need to know and figure out what are going to be the minimum floodplain elevations. Can that house be rebuilt on the same level that it was? What if the Santa Barbara County had the funds available to it to purchase and compensate owners for those properties that are not buildable or not safely buildable? Imagine if flood control and planning for that was done not on a property-by-property -property basis, but on a neighborhood basis. Let me bring that home. I had 68 loads of mud taken off my property so far, and a landscape architect and an architect told me how I could defend my property from the common enemy or peril of water or mud. But if I do that, my neighbor gets screwed. I don't want to do that. So if my neighbors and we could all sit down collaboratively and say, what's the best way for us to defend our properties collectively, come up with a common solution that benefits all of us the most, wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? So I want us to think imaginatively. This is pretty provocative. There are some areas in Montecito that are no longer suitable for single family homes to be per built. What if instead we built two or three-story multifamily 
condominiums, apartments even, in Montecito. I'd like to... <laughs> um, <laughs> you heard it here. Um, how are we going to encourage people to do these things to their properties to make them not what they were, but to make them better? Well, one idea that comes to mind is for us to obtain tax abatement for the resilient portion of a home rebuild or improvement. So, by example, if somebody's home is destroyed, it's going to cost two million to rebuild it. Three hundred thousand would make it a resilient building against climate change perils. Why not give tax abatement for ten years or some period for the three hundred thousand dollar portion of that? So. Bottom line, there are some tools, there are some things, there are creativity to be brought to it, but what it depends for it to happen is some thinking out of the box, an extraordinary amount of cooperation and collaboration, and the will to turn our desires into a better future. I hope we can do that. Uh, our next